Hey, it's me. As you can tell from the title, this is a video essay where I will be talking about something that I've been wanting to talk about on my channel for a very long time. I needed to wait until I had the time to gather research and provide the most thorough video that I could. And side note, the amount of times I've cried, dropped my jaw, covered my eyes, and had to take a break from doing research while creating this video was a lot, to say the least. I'm going to say right now that this video talks heavily about violence and sexual assault of women. Later in the video, I will read a few assault stories, so if you need to skip segments of details, please skip between these timestamps. They will be listed in the description as well, and I will remind you before I read any stories. In this video essay, we will be talking about a major epidemic that is, sadly, often referred to as the silent epidemic, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. This term includes the following, domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, homicide, stalking, kidnapping, and sex trafficking. If you've seen the hashtags MMIW, MMIWG, or No More Stolen Sisters, this epidemic is what they're referring to. This hashtag mostly refers to peoples indigenous to North and Central America and the Arctic, although I, and I'm sure many other people, recognize that this is an issue worldwide. The majority of the statistics in this video reference North American and Alaska natives, mostly reported from the United States, and all sources claim to include trans women and two-spirited people. This problem is so large and is rooted in several causes that it may be beyond the scope of a single video essay, but I will try my best to at least mention everything I can think of. If you would like to join in on the conversation or add anything that I've missed, I invite you to participate in the comment section. Please be respectful. All of my sources will be listed in the description. I encourage you to conduct research on your own as well and to not use this video as your sole education on the subject. Let's get into it. Before talking numbers, I first want to point out the problems associated with obtaining these numbers. Earlier research did not include native people living in urban areas, despite 71% living in urban areas. Many systems recording victims and crime either don't list race or ethnicity, include native as a race, or they wrongfully identify a victim's race. Even the Urban Indian Health Institute's report on MMIW began with large capital letters stating that their statistics are most likely underreported. With that being said, the following numbers are high, but could actually be higher. I'm going to read these statistics off in list form, so hopefully doing so won't reduce the impact these numbers would have on you if I had read them in a different way. Native women are murdered 10 times more than other races and ethnicities. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Homicide, homicide is the third leading cause of death for Native women ages 10 to 24 and the fifth leading cause of death for ages 25 to 34 in the United States. In Canada, Native women ages 25 to 44 are five times more likely to experience a violent death compared to non-Native women. In 2016, the National Crime Information Center reported that there were 5,712 known incidents of missing and murdered Indigenous women in the United States. 84% of Native women and 82% of Native men experience violence in their lifetime. That is, 4 out of 5 Native women and men that have experienced violence. According to the National Congress of American Indians, Natives are 2.5 times as likely as other races to experience violent crimes and are twice as likely to experience sex crimes. 56% more than half of Native women have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime, and over a third have been raped. 49% of Native women have experienced stalking, 89% of which were stalked by a non-Native perpetrator. 
Native women are five times as likely to have experienced physical violence by an interracial intimate partner as white women. 96% of sexual violence against female victims was perpetrated by non-Native people. In a study where the Urban Indian Health Institute analyzed 506 cases in 71 cities in 29 states, 23% of the perpetrators were never found guilty or held accountable. The majority of these murders are also committed on Native-owned land, which is an important factor in the epidemic. Although the maltreatment of indigenous women has a long history, the UIHI noted the lack of record keeping in prior decades. In their study, 80% of the 506 cases occurred since the year 2000. Among the many other issues with case reporting systems, 75% of the cases had no tribal affiliation listed. 95% of the cases weren't covered by national or international media, and the media coverage for the cases that were covered contained harmful language and no media follow-up on the case. Some of that language included victim-blaming language, heavy mentioning of sex work and drugs, and misgendered trans women. An example of this phenomenon with the media is the Highway of Tears located in British Columbia, where 18 women vanished from the same area, most of which were native. It's been said that the Highway of Tears did not receive adequate coverage nor focus on the race of the victims until it was a white woman that vanished from the area. These statistics were taken from a handful of sources, but there are many more sources out there that might have different numbers because the data came from different areas. Again, I encourage doing your own research. Now, I know I just threw a lot, like a lot of numbers at the screen and in your ears. As I said before, I hope you were able to fully take in what these numbers mean. Oftentimes, reading statistics in list form numbs you by the third bullet point, and soon you're reading just that, numbers. It is important to remember that these are more than just numbers. These are thousands of women, daughters, mothers, sisters, aunts, cousins, friends, wives, girlfriends. These sisters were and are people with entire lives and networks of loved ones goals, hopes, and dreams, and a place within their communities. Here I will read just a few stories of experiences with racial violence. At this point, please skip to this timestamp if you are triggered by violent descriptions. I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Anita Lucchesi, a doctoral student at the University of Lethbridge in Canada, who has created a database of over 2,600 cases of MMIW from the U.S. and Canada, had a student named Ashley Loring Heavy Runner. Heavy Runner went missing in June of 2017 from the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana. Her sister said she reached out to the Bureau of Indian Affairs for help, but after nine months of searching, she received no new information. The FBI didn't step in until March of 2018, she added. Over a year since her disappearance, Lori Heavy Runner is still missing. Lucchesi herself said she was once raped by a non-indigenous man who made comments about her looking like Pocahontas. She also recalled that later, when she was walking through Spokane, Washington, on her way back from a concert with friends, she was confronted by a white man who insisted on paying them for sex. Thank God my friend had a baseball bat in the car, Lucchesi said. He was following us, screaming at us, offered us 50 bucks each, and said, That's a lot for Indian girls. You're not even worth that much. It was all based on a stereotype of who we are as Native women. Lynette Keener, a 56-year-old woman from the Blackfeet Nation in Montana, worked as a housekeeper at the Super 8 Motel near her home. On December 21, 2015, while she was stripping a suite clean, Scott Price and Sarah McKnight entered the room, demanding the car keys to her red 2009 Chevrolet Malibu. When McKnight fled to start the vehicle, Price assaulted Keener, stole her master key to the hotel, and forced her into a new room, fatally stabbing her multiple times in the process. Price and McKnight fled Montana immediately after the murder, making it all the way to Idaho, where local law enforcement found the pair in a motel. 
Price has the numbers 14 and 88 tattooed on his neck, with 14 representing the 14-word slogan, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. The figure 88 signifies Hail Hitler because H is the eighth letter of the English alphabet. McKnight has six swastikas and an 88 on various parts of her body. She also has the word Aryan tattooed on her left index finger. During the investigation, McKnight said Price killed Keener because she was Native American, according to a court report. Another record shows that they both expressed white supremacist beliefs online through Facebook. The crime was not prosecuted under Montana's hate crime law. Brunner, who is an Anishinaabe member of the White Earth Nation in Minnesota, said that she survived numerous sexual assaults by non-Native and Native American men alike, which drove her to advocate for the past 20 years on behalf of other victimized Native American women. One night in 2011, Brunner's niece left the family home late at night to attend a party in the community without letting her family know. Brunner's daughter, who was 17 at the time, woke up and noticed her cousin had left and went to search for her alone. As Brunner's daughter walked through the community in search of her cousin, a black SUV rolled up beside her with four men inside. They told her to jump in the car and they'd all, quote-unquote, go party and have fun, Brunner said. Her daughter shook her head and told them no, but the men chased her down and dragged her into the vehicle. The four non-native men wore bandanas over their faces like cowboys. One was driving, two of them held her down, and one of them raped her. Brunner said. When they were done with her, they threw her out by a bridge on the outskirts of town. They threatened to kill her and come kill her family if she told anyone. It took Brunner's daughter a month to tell her mother. When Brunner called tribal law enforcement, an officer took the statement over the phone and told Brunner they could do a forensic interview weeks later. Uncomfortable with the long wait time, Brunner called her uncle, who at the time was the police chief, and got a forensic interview the next day. After that, Brunner said that there was little follow-up about her daughter's rape, a response she said she expected. I told them, the system is useless. You're going to prove to me today how useless you are. Many non-Native people coming onto the reservation know that law enforcement can't touch them, she said. We as Native women are hunted. We are deliberately sought after by sexual predators, Brunner said. Aubrey Dameron left her home in Grove, Oklahoma on March 9, 2019. She left on foot to meet someone. She has not been heard from since. Where is Aubrey Dameron? December 24, 2019. As this year comes to an end, Aubrey is still missing. As the days continue to add up, people continue to talk, but no one can lead us to Aubrey. Everyone wants to tell others that they know something, but they can't provide any facts, only hearsay. Where is Aubrey? No one vanishes into thin air. Someone somewhere has seen her poster and continues to remain silent. Your silence is betrayal. As an indigenous trans woman, Aubrey was more at risk than other women. However, that's not an excuse for our niece's disappearance. We continue to push for answers. Our holidays are not the same. Our lives are not the same because she is not here. Aubrey has not been found. The article that was posted months ago about someone being arrested and her disappearance was someone who was charged for extortion, but law enforcement believed they had nothing to do with her disappearance. There have been no arrests for her disappearance. Please continue to share her face. We will not stop until we have answers. It is not difficult to locate stories of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Online searches will show you many. There are social media pages dedicated to sharing missing person posters and victim information. There are also community pages and social media dedicated to giving the community warnings and information about local perpetrators who have offended, attempted to offend, or are suspicious. How is such an enormous issue so unknown by the general population, so silent? Well, as mentioned before, most MMIW cases don't receive media attention. When they do receive attention, they're poorly reported. In addition to the lack of representation in and ownership of media for Native peoples, Our populations are outnumbered and therefore our voices drowned out by the masses. 
only 1.5 to 2% of the U.S. population are Indigenous peoples, and 4.9% of the Canadian population. Aside from racism that causes non-natives to not want to listen to our voices, too many people don't even know to listen in the first place. An overwhelming portion of society either does not know a single native person or actually believes that we all died off. More on the media later. Let's discuss some roots and causes of MMIW. Before diving into sociology and psychology, themes that are harder to prove as fact, let's first talk about more concrete findings that are also some of the biggest issue with the epidemic, law, jurisdiction, and resources. The history of tribal and U.S. relations is long and confusing, and it isn't a mandatory study for law students. In fact, as we've learned with several tribe versus U.S. cases, even the U.S. Supreme Court judges are poorly educated in Indian law. These relations involve constant battles over our sovereignty and ability to be our own administers, where we spend more of our time in the courtroom educating those who should already be educated rather than arguing for whatever we're there for. Among these many battles is how to deal with sexual and violent crimes. For example, due to a 1978 Supreme Court decision, non-Native men who assault Native women on reservations cannot be arrested or prosecuted by tribal authorities. The court decided that the federal government has jurisdiction over these cases. However, jurisdiction does not mean action. According to a 2010 Government Accountability Office report, over two-thirds of sexual abuse cases sent by tribal authorities to the FBI and U.S. Attorney offices were declined. The government and the courts are fully aware of this issue because this decision was reflected in the 2013 Violence Against Women Act, where reservations gained jurisdiction of domestic or dating violence, but not violent or sex crimes. Issues over jurisdiction are worsened by the fact that communication between tribal, federal, state, and local authorities is difficult, which hinders the ability to begin effective investigations. Difficult communication between agencies means authorities have to be highly committed to each case, which, let's be honest, this type of commitment is nearly impossible to keep up with if you consider the rates of MMIW. There is a lack of resources for authorities, such as training, equipment, and personnel that also hinders the investigation process. Although, inserting my personal opinion here, I question whether police are the only resource that should be utilized here in the first place. On top of all these problems, all of these problems, legitimate cases get dismissed as something else. Yet another reason some of the before-mentioned statistics may be underreported is because so many crimes are either unreported, uninvestigated, or reported as simple domestic violence issues. When it comes to these types of issues, there have been attempts at addressing the problems in the system through litigation, such as the Not Invisible Act, the Justice for Native Survivors of Sexual Violence Act, Savannah's Act, and Hannah's Act. Hannah's Act was named after 21-year-old Hannah Harris, who disappeared in 2013. It is Hannah's birthday, May 5th, that the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Native Women and Girls was appropriated. Moving on to the next point of how and why is the correlation between oil and MMIW. Yes, oil, the stuff that makes things go. Oil is a resource that needs to be extracted from specific geological areas, which are typically remote and near reservations. The men who work for oil extraction travel to the area from their homes, living in temporary communities or communal living quarters with fellow oil workers, called man camps. In areas where man camps exist, assault crimes increase. 
In fact, according to the University of North Dakota, a major production of oil in the Bakken oil formation located near the Montana-North Dakota state line brought tens of thousands of transient oil workers who stayed at man camps. By the end of this production in 2014, assaults on Native women had tripled. It isn't just the proximity of transient men and Native women that's a factor. These men are, as stated before, only temporarily in the area. Once they leave, it is much more difficult to find the perpetrators of these crimes, let alone their identities. Many of them are also aware of jurisdiction loopholes that allow them to get away with these crimes, so they purposely offend knowing this. There are countless stories of men who assault women off the reservation and then dump them across the quote-unquote reservation lines onto native land, making the federal government have jurisdiction of the case instead of the state, making it harder for them to be caught and successfully prosecuted. Another factor in why oil workers assault Native women can be generalized throughout all the cases of MMIW. Racial motivation. The more concrete, provable fact here is that these cases that are clearly hate crimes are not treated as hate crimes. The more theoretical statement here is that these are racially motivated hate crimes and there's several reasons that can explain why. So, let's get into them. I have a bachelor's of science in psychology and I spend a great deal of my time in sociology studies as well. So naturally, I'm fascinated with the human mind, human behavior, and how humans interact. It would be impossible for me to fully explain in a single video how certain messages and beliefs both affect and reflect human behavior, how microaggressions turn into epidemics. In other words, racism is both the cause and effect of racism, sort of like the chicken or the egg debate. This is the part where genocide and racism deniers have the most fun with, where they tell natives to get over it, it's not racist, that sounds ridiculous. They might say, I'm not racist, it's just a costume, or how is burning a plant appropriation? This can be likened to how, say, some non-black people refuse to understand that wearing box braids and other afro hairstyles is appropriation. But if you ask the same people if they think racism exists, I assume they would probably say yes. Everyone wants to talk about racism, but no one wants to acknowledge how they participate in its perpetuation. Because not only do most people not understand psychology and how things like stereotypes affect them, they may also not believe their psyche is affected in the first place. The reality is that everyone is affected by stereotypes and subliminal messages, both big or small, whether they choose to acknowledge that or not. Subliminal messages are mostly thought of as rumors of violent messages being hidden in music, effectively hypnotizing teenagers and telling them to do dangerous things. But they're actually messages spoken through the use of language, the choice of words, or the messages that images convey to you. A good example of how subliminal messages become learned behavior is the stop sign. I could imagine that seeing that red hexagon shape automatically derives an understanding of stop, whether you can read the language on the sign or if the sign is just blank. The harder to explain example of the connection between subliminal messages and human behavior would be those that lead to assaults on indigenous women and girls. So what are the most common messages being shared about native women? that we're inferior savages, we're probably poor, or alcoholics, or drug addicts, we're lazy and we get all our money from the casino, and we get government handouts, we're unintelligent, we're assailable, and we're promiscuous. There's even a centuries-old slur implying Native women are promiscuous that 
unfortunately never gets bleeped out or hidden with asterisks. Everyone feels entitled to be able to say it, and it's even the name of many geographical locations. In fact, it's included in the name of a business that 10,581 people signed a petition to be changed, but the owners still refused. More on the normalcy of anti-indigenous racism later. But the stigma of the promiscuous, good-for-nothing, savage woman is dangerously widespread, often combined with native women being fetishized and exotified for being other than white, basically. As mentioned in one of the stories before, when a woman was assaulted, her perpetrator told her that she looked like Pocahontas. And sadly, this is something that is said to so many other women as well, whether they were assaulted or catcalled. An ironic factor in women being likened to a sexy Pocahontas is Pocahontas was an MMIW herself, and she was literally a 10-year-old child during the events that John Smith wrote his fantastical story. Of course, everyone's knowledge of Pocahontas comes from Disney. And why did Disney change her age in the story? Because they wanted her to have sex appeal. And pedophilia isn't as acceptable as it was in John Smith's time. The use of Pocahati costumes are not just advocated against simply because they're tasteless and like, side note, how is it okay to dress up as an actual race? Like a whole ass race of people. But my main point is that Pocahati costumes also reinforce ideas that native women are promiscuous, sexy, and exotic. And they reinforce the fantasies of criminals, allowing them to justify their offenses. Costumes are the appropriation and desecration of sacred objects and regalia, which is evidence that society views native culture as open for consumption and profit. The stigmas attached to costumes are evidence that society, especially criminals, views native women as open for consumption ourselves. Remember when I talked about subliminal messages earlier? The media offers a plethora of harmful messages that reinforce the dehumanization of Native women. And in fact, they're also evidence of how Native women are viewed by non-Natives. I stated way earlier in the video that 95% of cases analyzed by the Urban Indian Health Institute were not covered by large media, and when they were, they were poorly reported. The UIHI analysis found that 38% of the reports referenced drugs or alcohol, 31% referenced the victim's criminal history, 11% referenced sex work, 8% gave false information on the case or did not name the victim, 4% made excuses for the perpetrator or used victim-blaming language, 3% showed images or video of victims' death, and 33% misgendered trans victims. Yasmin Jiwani states that even stories that highlight the success of Aboriginal women tend to reinforce stereotypes by making the women appear exceptional only because they have escaped the trappings of their culture. Warren Golding suggests that reporters prefer to cover stories about people they can empathize with. Kristen Gilchrist says a second reason that missing Aboriginal women may receive less coverage is a sense of otherness. She notes that in cases where the victims are white, media often communicate a theme of fear and outrage that violent predators are stalking our streets to harm our daughters. Very much like some birth of a nation crap. But we have little to no ideological power with media which is the power to decide what information to provide and thus define what common knowledge will be. Natives don't get articles about how these victims are family members and community members who had goals and dreams, or had hobbies and interests, or had personalities. The themes instead talk about poverty, addiction, unemployment, and other nonviolent crimes, which reinforce the idea that victims sort of choose their fate. Though many victims have no experience with any of those negative factors, there are victims that do, but even in those cases, it's still not an excuse or an explanation for the crime. 
Articles detailing these negative aspects typically fail to talk about the structural and historical issues plaguing the general Native population that puts Natives at risk in the first place, such as slavery, extreme violence, cultural eradication, and destruction of tribal communities. Maddie Greer also pointed out how colonization and assimilation destructed matrilineal societies and the systems in which women had shared power. Unfortunately, in Western culture, race operates in a hierarchy. When Native women were stripped of any power and Native communities assimilated to accept European patriarchal culture, Native women landed at the bottom of the hierarchy as being oppressed by both race and gender a phenomenon called intersectionality, coined by the Black scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. Of course, this essay and this epidemic is largely about Native women and how this intersection impacts our quality of life and fear that we or someone we love could be the next victim, while MMIW is often referred to as the silent epidemic because it isn't common knowledge, Yet, the themes and causes are similar to more well-known battles, like the one against sports mascots. It isn't only women being dehumanized here, it's the native population as a whole. Animalistic cartoons and mascotry, red face, fake headdresses, fake drums, war whoops, and tomahawk chops, Twitter user at Indigenous AI conducted a meta-analysis of tweets associated with native mascots and found that 172,768 tweets contained a combination of racist slurs and support for a mascot team. And what I find, personally, the absolute most degrading, and I'm sure many others would agree, is the stabbing of blades through fake rubber native heads and holding signs that say, scalp them, bro, as if the fantasies and acting out of killing natives when that was and is a very real thing in history wasn't evident enough that the general population is desensitized to our deaths, go ahead and search Native American Tattoo and see how many times a dead Indian shows up especially Indian skulls and headdresses. The term redskins, which NFL lovers assert is not racist, literally originated from when settlers collected bloody scalps from natives they murdered. Bounties ordered and paid for by the government. Mascots don't only negatively depict natives for non-native consumption, but a study by Stephanie Freiberg at the University of Arizona even found that mascots had a negative impact on the self-esteem of Native children. Heather Davidson told Teen Vogue how anti-Native racism is so normalized and integrated into Western society and culture that it isn't even recognized at all. Tribe names are used to name U.S. military weapons. They're used for vehicles. How many of you live in an area with a name derived from an indigenous language and you had no idea? You live in Massachusetts, Michigan, Manhattan, Miami, Chicago? How many times have you used phrases such as the bottom of the totem pole, having a powwow, so-and-so is my spirit animal, I'm on the warpath, or I went off the reservation? Did you have any idea that common knowledge of tribal names is inaccurate? Besides the obvious fact that we're not Indians, the Sioux are not the Sioux. They're the Lakota and the Dakota, with further denominations such as the Oglala Lakota. The Iroquois are not the Iroquois. They are the Haudenosaunee, again with denominations such as the Tuscarora. My tribe is not the Chippewa, we are Anishinaabe. Our denomination is the Ojibwe. Anishinaabe also includes the Potawatomi and the Odawa. How many times have you seen dream catchers and white sage being sold in stores? Fake headdresses? Each one of those is a desecration of sacred items. Listen, I'm not trying to call you out here or make you feel guilty. Well, unless you deserve it. 
I'm trying to help you understand how normalized anti-Indigenous racism is. Heather Davidson also stated, quote, There's genuine harm in these actions, whether it's microaggressions, appropriation, stereotypes, subtle or overt racism, they all hurt us. Non-natives do not get to define or decide what is or isn't racist or harmful to native people, or the degree of relevance of certain issues. Only natives can, end quote. It's all interconnected. Trees don't have a single root, and their roots are tangled. Research and learn. I've listed every source I used in the description. Feel free to check those out and do research on your own. There's a lot of information out there. Listen to natives and support us. Seek out native authors and activists. Don't appropriate our cultures. If you would like to appreciate certain items, support native people and not corporations. Native people know what is okay for you to have. You are currently on stolen land. Learn the name of the tribe whose land you're on. Address racism when you see it. Have conversations with the people doing it. Don't try to be the voice for native peoples. Rather, uplift native voices. Ask questions, but be careful to not create more labor for the native people you're asking. If you are white or white passing, use your privilege in instances where natives are being targeted. Recognize that not everyone is perfect. If you make a mistake and are called out on it, please take the criticism. I get that sometimes the person criticizing you could come off as hostile, but if you step in their shoes, you will see that because the majority of the time we address racism, we are met with hostility. Contact grassroots organizations and see how you can help. Some examples include the Jingle Dress Project, Tiny House Warriors, and the Red Ribbon Skirt Society. You could also look for organizations that are more local to you. Be aware of your surroundings, especially if you live in an area where MMIW is common. Visit pages listing missing person information. Raise awareness. Talk about MMIW. Talk about anti-indigenous racism. Share articles. Share videos. Share this video. The violence needs to stop. No more stolen sisters. Way, hey, ah, yo, way, hey, ah, yo.
Way, hey, ah, your way. 